welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Libraries Turn the Page podcast, and I am here with the author, uh, Mina Hardy. <laughs> Hi, Mina Hardy. How are you? Um, and we are going to talk about your book, We Knew All Along, which uh, before we started recording, I was telling Mina that, you know, um, anybody who knows my reading taste, it's usually like, I'll pick a book up and I'll be like, okay, is this going to hurt me in some way and give me more of this? Because I read generally a lot of um suspense domestic suspense horror thriller um and there are times and i'm not going to say that this devalues the book because i still love them but there are times because i read so many of these books i see certain threads and i'm like oh this is what's going to happen and it happens and i'm like cool i got that that did not happen at all while reading this book and hey. it was so <laughs> delightful and so good and yes it did hurt me in the ways that I want my psychological suspense <laughs> to hurt me um I'm like I said you sorry know, yeah. but I'm not <laughs> oh no it's fine you know what like I said like you know people who do listen to a lot of my uh interviews because a lot of the librarians now do interviews um you know there are books that I'm I'll be like oh this book was not horror it was not domestic suspense and I loved it and you know like usually like that's almost like a surprise because I know I I know what my reading type has been for quite a while and you know that's wonderful but at the same time you know I like things that really just keep my mind going things that right. distract me from the horror that's actually happening in the world yeah. um so usually when I see a book that looks ominous, as we knew all along did, uh, I was like, <laughs> yep, inject that into my veins. Let's go. Um, so wh why don't you talk a little bit about this book before uh, I continue to gush? Um, all right. Uh, talk about this book. So it actually was an idea that I'd been tossing around for a long time, years and years, I guess, um, even before I started ri really writing domestic suspense. Um, Mina Hardy is actually a pen name. It is not a secret. I will just out myself. My real name is Megan Hart. Um, so I've written mostly or published mostly romance. Um, so I had the core idea of we knew all along it, just for years and years, um, just the basic idea that what would happen if an old flame showed back up in your life in the worst way possible? And what would that mean? So long ago, I probably had been thinking about it more as like maybe a sexy romance, but <laughs> that didn't happen. So when I started working on uh, We Knew All Along, I, I really just had that, all right, so here's the tiniest little kernel of a situation. Somebody shows up in your life from the past. Um, and, and how does that basically wreck the, the main character's life? And from there, I just built on, all right, so well, why wouldn't you just tell, give him the heave ho and say, get lost? Like what, you know, what's holding her there? Why can't she just leave? Why can't she just tell her husband, get out? <laughs> like, what are all the reasons why someone would seemingly willingly while complaining about it stay in a situation that just is clearly not making them happy and um so that's just where the the book started and how it ended where it ended up was was a long um tangled journey and a lot of discovery along the way and um, I will say that a lot of times I'm never really sure how a book is going to hit you know other people or um even, you know, even if the, at the end of it, if it's good, <laughs> I mean, I might think it's great. And other, you know, most other people, they're like, this is the worst thing I've ever read. Um, but there were times when I was mostly in the polishing and revising as I was going back and through and after having written the, the, the first, you know, draft of it, when I started layering in what I wanted to be those, you know, WTF moments, like, kind of like watching the sixth sense where you're reading along and then only later you're like what 
Oh, okay. I get that. Now I see what that meant. So I'm not sure if I succeeded with that part of it, but I had some, I had some moments at my desk. Where I was like, yes, yes. I got <laughs> so that was a good, it was a good too. And I was like, it, but like for me, like I mentioned before, it was like, wait, what, what? <laughs> so it worked. <laughs> um, so the main character of this story, her name is Jewel Ann. Um, she's married to a, uh, guy named Ken who travels a lot yeah. for work um she has a teenage son named Eli who has some emotional issues and also a lot of trouble connecting with other people uh, he doesn't really have friends um and Christian or CC Christian Campbell mm -hmm. is her former high school um flame who yes. uh is you know Jewel Ann goes to her reunion kind of with an agenda to to, to mess with him and yes. uh the messing ends up coming back to her uh and <laughs> she's already yeah. sort of a mess um in her own life you know I, I have to kind of also throw something out there that I really loved about this book um and I know this I don't know how else to phrase it than this. I love that the protagonist, I love that Jewel Ann was casually, she's a Jewish protagonist. And it's mm -hmm. not the focal point of her, but casually mm -hmm. it's just, it's who she is. And I loved that, you know, like there's like a few parts where she just, you know, she makes references to celebrating Hanukkah or somebody says, you know, have a good Christmas to her. And she's like, I never do because I don't celebrate it. Um, you know, which, um, <laughs> which, was you know it was it was a really refreshing take on being like you know a lot of times you read these books and you just assume that somebody is you know christian um it's or celebrate default. christmas rather yeah and you know it's like nope she's a jewish protagonist it doesn't 100 percent define who she is but it is important to her it's not um so uh i am jewish and i am a religious person and that you know that's that is my religion but like jewel ann it's not I mean, I, I celebrate the Jewish holidays, including Shabbat every Friday. And um, I, I think it's hard, or I find it hard. I always find characters who are not Christian in books. And a lot of times, if they're not, the religion is like really, like, it's not a Jewish book. It's not a Jewish story. And not all Jewish people are Orthodox observant Jews. So many people in the community are just, you know, Jewish exactly, just the way I am, just the way Jewel Ann is, where it's, it is a big part of who we are, but it is not, that's not the point of the story. It's, it's just, exactly that's who she is. So I'm writing it, there was no way to not, um, so when, the, in the time frame that the book is set, um, there's an, it, I include um, reference to the Jewish holidays, because that is something that she would have been doing but it's not a story about celebrating the Jewish holidays. Um, so it's I'm, a story about a person you. living her life the way that she would live her life. Yes. And this is how she would be living her life. She would be thinking about the high holidays, you know, the high holy days. Yes. She would, you know, because it is something that she, you know, she does, but it's also not the point of the story. And I really, right. really appreciated how well it was written. Um, another Thank thing, you. yeah, another thing that I really loved is just how, again, like I said, how many layers there are to it. You know, you, you know <laughs> that something's not right with Ken and you definitely know that something's not right with Christian Campbell. Um, <laughs> And you have Jewel Ann connecting with some former friends from high school. And it's just like this really interesting piece where it's like you look at a painting up close and then the further back you look, the more you see. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give Ken, I'm going to give uh, my editor, Melissa Rector, total credit because she worked with when we were when I was working to sell this book to her um, she worked with the publisher to kind of fine-tune the synopsis before I wrote the book and basically Ken's awfulness really came 
they were they were like look he, you know he needs to be worse like what can you do to make him <laughs> how can he be worse you know than he is and um so they really you know pushed for for that aspect of it and i'm really glad because it allowed me then to you know open that up and figure out ways like how could, how that could work and how that affected everything and um i wanted him to be but i I didn't want him to be so awful right from the bat in such an obvious way that you're like, well, you know, oh gosh, he's just, he's just so awful. Why he's would you? He's kind of a drip at first. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of like a drip. You're like, uh, okay, Ken. Yeah, like, all right, stuck in the 50s, you know. <laughs> um, and I also, though, so, um, so Julianne is a, is a stay home she was the stay home parent. Now her son's in high school and she hasn't gotten a job since then, which is part of the con her internal conflict and revolving around money and different issues. And I also just kind of wanted to touch on not that the book is about this either, but just that the person who stays home, if there is a person who stays home in a relationship, how, how worthwhile that person's work is, but how undervalued because running a house is not easy um and she doesn't do a great job of it <laughs> so she's not which even you know okay. she's not really great at it <laughs> yeah which is okay because she's dealing with enough and yes. like I really want to talk more about what she's dealing with uh oh by the way Christian Campbell decides he's going to move into her carriage house she's living in right. um the house that she grew up in by the way people this is what's happening uh, you know, she goes and she she has this agenda to sort of like get back at him for something that happened when they were in high school. And um, then all of a sudden he shows up and he wants to rent their carriage house, which she yeah. and he have a history in. And Ken <laughs> is like, yeah, let's do this. And Julianne yeah, is like, any friend of yours what? Is a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cautionary tale about seeking revenge on your old flame at your high school reunion per, leave you know, it perhaps. alone that is, the, <laughs> that is the cautionary the the moral of the ca cautionary story is leave it alone revenge is yeah, not worth what you it. might get <laughs> i had um always kind of pictured um christian as this real smooth talker kind of like christian from nip talk honestly uh, if anybody is familiar that show's been off the air for a while but just like a smooth talker but you, you know he's bad for you but you just can't get over him even though he's not that great now but he was and um so I had a lot of fun with him just being <laughs> just being kind of awful and but yet appealing and yeah but cautionary tale don't 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 look up old flames not or worth don't it. Don't try to go after old flames. There's a, re <laughs> there's a reason why things end. <laughs> I, I also, but so, so he's living in her house and he suddenly, you know, she's already got some issues with Ken. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned before, I'm dancing around a lot of stuff because I don't want to give it away. Um, so this is just the ven very general part, including my reactions. Uh, but then, okay. so yeah, so Christian kind of um starts some sort of like mentor relationship with Eli and right. that is even more disturbing in a way because Eli is so influential and you could tell he's hurting so so much and Julian knows this yeah and e Eli really wants and needs like a good father figure where on the surface, Ken would seemingly be the perfect father figure. I mean, he's about, he's all about sitting down for family dinners and family time and, you know, being, being like a beave it, beave it, <laughs> leave it to beaver kind of, you know, dad. Yeah, beave it to leave her. <laughs> leave it to leave her dad. Yeah. But, um, but he's not, he's not a present parent. He's traveling all the time and he's, he doesn't know his kid or his wife. Well, and you know, like, Christian... but that's but that's very um that that speaks very much to the the leave it to leaver the leave it to beaver <laughs> mythos because it was a lie. You know, this was this ideal you were supposed to have, 
And right. I mean, I know we can we can talk about Kinsey and we can talk about other um, psychological, you know, like Betty Friedan and other psychological studies of people from back then. This was not really what was happening, even if it was modeled, right. you know, there was right. unhappiness, there was cheating, there was, there were, you know, people, there were men who slept with men, there were women who slept with women, yep. there were, you know, there women were, were there was depression. The home. Yep, yes. absolutely, yeah. yeah. And the women who stayed home, I mean, there's the Rolling Stones wrote that song. Mother's about Little Helper, Helper, right? or yeah, mother's little helper. And, yeah. you know, that was a very real thing. And, um, you know, just that the whole idea of the woman stays home and takes care of everything. And that is supposed to be like the be all end all. And it, this book is set in contemporary times. The main characters are, I'm in my early fifties. So they're a bit younger, but even I, who was a child in the seventies, my mom worked, you know, my my dad worked part they worked hours so that one or the other of them was home with us but my mom went to work like it just that that 50s housewife was not something my grandmother worked I never saw that modeled in my own life and yet um I was the stay-home parent for for years and years and years when my kids were small and and like it was not something that I ever actually thought that would have that I would do. <laughs> um, but I did. And it's all, you know, TV and movies do not portray real life even now. So when we look back, we didn't, if you didn't live in that time, all you have is leave it to Beaver. And it's like, oh, that's how it must have been. Everybody must have had this life and most people didn't and if you did live in that time you probably wondered what was wrong with your family <laughs> right <laughs> like why aren't we like the tv you know the couples on tv or the families on tv and um as far as ken's character he's he's really on the surface he's really into that and he tells his wife well this is how I grew up in this super traditional house and my mom didn't work and she took care of the family and he he doesn't want her to get a job because that would mean that he's not providing for the family in the way that he should and it's in some ways an an outdated um viewpoint that he has but but also like he's also not telling her the truth about his reasons for sure i mean nobody's nobody is really telling the truth and i think that that's yeah. kind of something <laughs> important to note about this book um even jewel Lynn is not a hundred percent telling the truth and she has her yeah. reasons um and i i suppose christian campbell and ken also have their reasons but i'm a yeah. little bit less sympathetic to both of them um right. and then eli you know jewel Lynn is almost like a prisoner in this contraption and eli is even more so. Um, and as a kid who, as you mentioned, really needs a father figure, really needs this, you know, my heart really hurt for him, especially as the mom of boys, you know, little boys are very yeah. sensitive and toxic masculinity takes many different forms, including the one that Ken and Christian both have. Um, mm -hmm with repressing feelings or, you know, you have to ask, act a certain way, or you have to do certain things to get people to like you. Right. And Christian's motivation, he, he is not, he does not have a selfless motivation to just mentor this kid and, you know, be kind. I mean, he sees Eli's need to have a father figure and he really uses that and manipulates it. I don't, I don't think that that's a spoiler. I think you could tell from from the first chapter that Christian is not a good good guy who's gonna just do something out of the goodness of his heart um but again it all ends up uh, Julian is a prisoner because she she's in this situation where without giving too much away she she can't she just feels it, it, in an impossible situation and she can't leave her house or her marriage and she just has to kind of like, she's juggling all these things, but she's juggled for a really long time. And she just starts dropping everything one by one. 
drop her, dropping all the plates. That's what she's doing. <laughs> so without discussing the many endpoints, did you start at the end and work backwards when you were writing this? Um, uh, no, I, although a lot of times I do, when I'm writing a book, I always like to say, I, I generally know the beginning and I often know the end and the middle is a vast wonderland of what if. So I did ultimately know when I started writing this, I did ultimately know um, what the, what the big bad thing was, but I wasn't entirely sure how the book was going to end. Um, so I didn't start at the end and I actually kind of wrote a lot of the middle first. <laughs> um, I write out of order and then rearrange the chapters. So a lot of times I will be writing something. Is, is that difficult? I must ask. I used to write in order, write chapter one, then write chapter two, then write chapter three. And actually I found I can be more productive if I have a, a basic outline and I say, okay, I know I need a scene where Julian confronts Ken. I'm not feeling the scene where Julian drinks a lot with her friends on the porch today, even though I know that's going to happen. So I'm going to write the scene where Julian confronts Ken. Um, it helps me keep moving forward. And sometimes if I just, if I start by writing something that I know has to be in there, that'll spark something else for another scene that I hadn't thought of yet. And if, and if I had tried to write, so if I write the scene, I'll just say where Julian confronts Ken, um, and something happens in that scene that I hadn't thought was going to happen, then when I write an earlier scene, I know that is in there and I can put that in there instead of going back and revising to put it in, I can write it as though that happened already. I am not a plotter. I am a pantser. Um, or I guess I'm a planter where I'll have an idea where I have basic, you know, middle idea, beginning, ending. I, I know there are points that I'm going to cover, but I don't usually know necessarily how I'm getting from one point to another until it happens. And I try to write with a lot of openness to, I'm going to see where this goes. And sometimes that's great. And sometimes I have to rewrite the whole first part of the book because I didn't think about what I wanted to be in there. But that's that's my process. That's how does it that, works. Does that make it longer? Like, does that make it more difficult or take more time to write the book, do you think? I don't think so because as I'm writing, even if I'm writing out of order, I'm writing much faster than if I was just trying to force myself to write in order something that's not either not motivating me, I'm not quite sure what it is, or it's a it's a scene that's more of a transitional scene. Um, not that it's not important because all the scenes should be important, but if it's something that's not a big reveal moment or something like that, if I just tried to force myself to write everything in order, I would spend a lot more time just staring at my screen and not actually making words. So I'm very much of the, I'm just gonna write it as fast as I can and then revise it later. Revising is actually my, I love that part of it because it's where I get to make everything work the way I want it to if it didn't come out that way to begin with. But sometimes if I get really stuck, I have gone back and written, all right, I'm going to start revising chapter one. I've got chapter two, chapter three, and revise up until the point where I need something new and hope that by the time I have revised those earlier chapters and get to where I need to do something new that I'm feeling more like, okay, this is what I need to do here. Um, so it doesn't, I don't think it takes longer overall, but I sometimes do revisit parts of the book more than one time because I've written out of order. But then at the end of it, if I've revised the first half a bunch of times, then it's less revising that I have to do when I'm finished with everything. Thank you for all of this. I think people are going to love this book. Um, it's wonderful. We knew all along is just it, it's just so. <laughs> so layered it's so good um and really thank you so much for taking the time and chatting with me about it i i do um, me. please come back write more books I have <laughs> so I come one back. I'm, working <laughs> I'm working on another one um for crooked lane um it's another mina hardy title and um it's got another jewish main character so yeah nice and um I hope I hope people love it. I don't write likable characters. 
that's okay. I, re- I, it's, <laughs> I, I really liked the book and I liked aspects of characters, even if they weren't a hundred percent likable. I think that um, I don't always have to like a character to want to know what happened to them. Agreed. That's how I, that's how I do it. That's what I like to read. That's what I like to write. But if you want, if you want people that you're just going to just l- think are the best ever, maybe, maybe my book isn't for you. <laughs> bad well, people making good, bad choices. <laughs> once again, this was Jessica with Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast. Definitely read We Knew All Along by uh, Mina Hardy. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we, <laughs> we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Bye. Bye. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.